This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora and welcome to the Kim Hill Collection. There was no better science communicator than Paul Callahan. He was a physicist by training, but he had this really wonderful empathy and open-mindedness and enthusiasm. He could think like a normal person as well as thinking like a mega smart science person, and that is not a skill that everybody has. Paul, of course, died in 2012 at the age of 64, just 64. Really sad. He was a regular contributor to Saturday Morning. Him and Kim had this beautiful rapport and fondness for one another that really shines through. So here they are chatting uh, back in 2006. Enjoy. Callaghan of the Antarctic joins me now. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Kim. How many times have you been down on uh, on the ice now? I think this is my sixth time down here. I think this is your sixth time. That's extraordinary, <laughs> isn't it? it do, is you, extraordinary. do you ever get tired of it? Mm, it's something about the place draws me back again and again, I guess. No, I don't get tired of it. I love being here, to be honest. And I think you've been down here, haven't you, Kim? I have you know been down there. About. Yeah, it's a fantastic place. What is your mission? Well, my mission is to get out there on the sea ice and make measurements of brine mobility, the little water molecules that are moving around in the ice. It might seem frozen, but there's a little fraction of the sea ice that's still liquid, and we're using magnetic resonance to map that to see how much there is in there at different depths and to see how fast it moves around. With the aim of? Ah, with the aim of, well, of course, um, it's intrinsically interesting, but it, it relates to a, a major New Zealand a research program that's been going on for many years called the New Zealand Sea Ice Project, and I'm just a small player in that. And that's been led by a man called Tim Haskell, who's run this mission and run this field camp uh, out on the ice for many years. And the, the idea is to try to understand sea ice behaviour from the very large scale, the way it forms and breaks up, right down to the micro scale, which is where I come in. And, of course, sea ice is incredibly important in terms of trying to model global climate. Uh, it, the formation of Antarctic sea ice is one of the biggest seasonal events on the planet, and you've got something larger than the area of the United States formed around Antarctica every winter, which has a huge effect on the reflectivity of the Earth and the whole global energy balance. So that's the, that's the big picture stuff, but I'm really in there at the micro scale. I suppose it's fair to say that global climate warming, global climate change has led to a renewal, should there ever have been a diminishment of interest in Antarctica, has it? Yes, that's very true. I mean, many of the projects down here this season are related in some way to global climate change. And, of course, one of the major ones is the Andril project, which I guess will be making quite a lot of publicity in the next uh, week or two. Um, that's a project involving a, a number of countries led by New Zealand in which they're drilling through the Ross Ice Shelf right through the ocean down to the, um, the rock underneath to try to get information about... Uh, the ice shelf responses to climate forces over the last 60,000 years. And I think we've got Minister Steve Mahari and uh, David Parker, the Minister of Climate Change, coming down here next week, and I think there may be some major announcements about that project then. But I was just speaking to the guys last night when they came in off the ice, and they just managed to cement in the drill casing at the bottom of the sea. So that's a major milestone for the end drill project. So they're on their way now, drilling down to try to get into that rock. And drill stands for Antarctic drilling and I think there are four countries involved, New Zealand, United States, Italy and Germany. So That's right, yes. It's hailed as a, a good cooperative venture, although we're a project operator, I think. That's right. I, I think it's New Zealand drillers and uh, it's New Zealand infrastructure that's really uh, providing the, the operation. But the science uh, participation from many countries, as you say. So, yeah, it's a, it's a high-profile activity for Antarctica, New Zealand, this year. Not one that I'm involved with, but you can't help but be aware of it. In fact, you can look out from Scott Base and see the drill site about 10 kilometres out on the ice shelf. Uh, the visibility down here, of course, <laughs> is hundreds and hundreds of kilometres, so you can't help but see uh, this, this project going on. You didn't have to go all the way down there to study sea ice, of course. Have you heard about these icebergs? Only, what, 260 k's off the South Island? Yeah, I just picked it up on the news yeah. beforehand. It's fascinating, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to do, they say, with, um, with global warming, they don't think. Well, you know, global climate change produces changes in patterns uh, around the world. And, you know, we've had a very cold winter in New Zealand this year, and I understand that 
that's been largely because of very cold seas around New Zealand. And it's, I think global climate change not only produces sort of an average warming across the globe, but can produce local fluctuations as well. And uh, there's been a change in sea temperature distributions in the Southern Ocean, and New Zealand's certainly felt that this year. And I suspect this iceberg phenomenon may well be associated with it, but I'm way outside my expertise when I talk about that. When you um, study your brine mobility, do you have to go out into the field? As it were? Yes, we do. We do. And I think that's one of the attractions for me. I, I, it's okay to be in Scott Base, but for me, the real attraction coming down here is to get out there and camp on the ice. So I've been out there for about 10 days now. Have you, where have you been out. camping? We've been camping this year just off Cape Evans. It's been a wonderful site because we've only been a few hundred metres from uh, Scott's hut. Hut, yes, yeah. the Terranova hut. And uh, we've got a series of containers that are dragged out there by a bulldozer. We have a diesel generator that can power them, and uh, there's a few tents as well. Uh, in fact, I get banished out to the tent to sleep because I tend to disturb some of the people in the containers at night if I sleep there. So, uh, <laughs> But I don't mind sleeping in a tent. Why? What do you do to disturb them? Oh, I, they, some of them claim I snore. But oh, I'm, sure it's not true. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true, Paul. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I love it out there, and uh, I think it's uh, just being at a location like that. These containers actually have ranch slider doors in the front of them so we can sit there in the warm and stare out at Mount Erebus watching our experiments running. Uh, we have to dash out there from time to time and uh, drill holes and pop the probes in but we do have warmth to go to even though we're camping. It's a shame you can't stay in the hut I suppose isn't it? <laughs> well we, we couldn't possibly do no. that. I mean, the, hut, the hut is really hallowed ground mm. and in, interestingly this year we've had um, neighbours out there, the Antarctic Heritage Trust have been out there working on the curating work and the care of that hut and also of course the Cape Royds hut uh, about uh, 15 kilometres north of us which I managed to visit yesterday that's the Shackleton hut yeah so uh, have you not been there before I have it's my I think it's the fourth time I've been in both those huts and I'm it's it's an extraordinary experience to go in there they're divine Uh, aren't they they are and of course I was brought up on those stories my father was an absolute uh Antarctic, uh, you know, a uh, nut. He was he was completely obsessed with the subject, and I was brought up on stories about Antarctica. So I think the first time that I went into Robert Falcon Scott's hut at um, Cape Evans, I was uh, able to know who slept in every single bed. There, you know, it was, it's it's uh, it's a wonderful place to go. And Shackleton's hut, as you'll know, is really uh, quite beautiful because it it's it's as though the men have just walked out there. Indeed, it's in that condition and. Uh, Literally frozen in time. Which one has got the large frozen penguin on the table? Is that Scott's hut? That's Scott's hut. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is bizarre. It's quite bizarre. It is bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, that, that hut suffered a little bit in 1917 from the Ross Sea Party that got stranded there and had to use the hut. And they didn't have enough supplies, so they had to, you know, live off uh, penguins and seals. And there was a lot of blubber fat boiled in there. So there's a lot of damage inside that mm. hut. It's not quite in the condition it was when Scott's party were there. But, but Shackleton's hut, of course, has not been used at all. And now they're places of, uh, of, of tremendous value and uh, they're cared for uh, extensively. And uh, there's a worry, of course, about how long they're going to last in the long term. But the, the Heritage Trust is doing a marvellous job and, and, and making sure that they're looked after the best possible degree. So the snow and the ice essentially has to be kept out of them. But, I mean, luckily, the conditions down, the conditions down there are fairly conducive to, uh, to keeping them, aren't they? That's right. But, I mean, I think the, the visiting of the huts by people every year does apparently have an impact. Just mm. the breath of uh, human beings walking through there. There's a limitation, I think, to a maximum of about 700 people a year are allowed to visit uh, Scott's Hut at uh, Cape Evans. And, of course, there are tour ships that go down there now, you see. And so uh, there's quite a lot of pressure from tourism during the summer months to go and visit those huts. Yeah. Are you um, you're back? Are you going out again on the field? No, no, I'm back at Scott Base now, hoping for a flight back on... Uh, on Monday, mm. but uh, no, we've finished our field work now, and I must say we've been extremely lucky this year because the weather down there has just been extraordinary. Cold, I mean, between minus 25 and perhaps minus 15, but we just have had very little wind, and we've had clear skies nearly every day, and it's just been quite beautiful out there on the ice. It's unbelievably it's clear on days like that, isn't it? Oh, yes, well, I can see forever. I, w- well, I went up the Barn Glacier, uh, the back of the Barn Glacier, up on the ramp, the area behind Scott's hut where I guess uh, people like Edward Wilson used to go up there and look. And I was standing up there 
uh, the other night, about uh, midnight, looking out over the top of the Barn Glacier, and I could see exactly the view that Edward Wilson had, when he, which he painted in watercolour in 1911. So it's extraordinary to, to uh, look across McMurdo Sound uh, in light conditions like that. But we've been very lucky in other respects. We've had several penguins visit us this year. We had five emperor penguins come through on Monday. Did you? And that was a marvellous uh, experience to have. And then uh, we had... Three a dailies came through the next day, uh, wandering through our campsite. So they're curious little creatures. They're quite happy to walk up to us and see what we're doing. So uh, it's been a very interesting year from the point of view of wildlife. And there's been a, a couple of uh, researchers out there fishing for Antarctic fish in Cape Evans too, drilling holes and popping down their lines and pulling them up. Uh, Victoria Metcalf and Ismay Robinson from uh, Canterbury University have been bringing up these Antarctic fish and then taking them back to Scott Base for analysis to look at antifreeze and lipids and various other sorts of chemical issues associated with how fish survive in these cold waters. Have they got a wee hut there and with a hole that they fish through or are they out in the open? No, they can't. They'd come out, yes, they'd go out in the open, but they come out on a daily basis right. uh, with one of the vehicles from Scott Base, the Piston Bully or one of the Haglins. Uh, sometimes they come out in skidoos and they'll drill a hole, pop their lines down, do their fishing, uh, put the fish in a container uh, in water so they can get them back to Scott Base in good condition. So for, it's about a, on a, uh, a good day and, and a good vehicle, it's about a, uh, an hour to two hour drive uh, to Cape Evans from Scott Base. When you're out in the field, Paul, what do you eat? Oh, <laughs> well, we don't eat enough vegetables and fruit, I must say, but we basically eat the standard field rations that are provided by Antarctica, New Zealand. Uh, quite a bit of meat, quite a bit of bread we bake out there. We have a bed bread baker. Um, we, we don't eat terribly well, uh, but we, we better to survive okay. Too many cheese sandwiches, uh, perhaps too much uh, pepperoni salami. Um, but when we've had a couple of visits, we've had some grapefruit brought out or a few bits of fruit and goodness me that's made a difference. So fruit never has tasted so delicious as when you've been doing without it for several days on the ice. Also you need a lot of carbohydrates don't you because everything takes so much more energy down there. Oh that's true I mean and one of the temptations in Antarctica is to eat and eat and eat because you tell yourself I'm working hard I'm out there in the cold my body needs this. Yeah. But every time Every time I've done it, I'm afraid I've put on a bit of weight, so I, it's very hard to get it right. But yes, we, we tend to spend a lot of our time eating down there. You, you, certainly the body craves food in these conditions. Is there an artist in Antarctica now at the moment? Oh, there is. I, sh I must mention we're so lucky. We had uh, Claire Plug, who's a, a, a quilter, and uh, Joyce Campbell, a photographer. And a, qu a, qu a quilter, a that'll come in handy. What a what? I mean, it was marvellous to, to, to see uh, examples of some of her work. She showed us some photographs of her work. It's quite beautiful. Uh, she's getting inspiration from the patterns in the ice down here. Uh, and, of course, we had Neil, Neil Dawson, who's the man who designed the globe in Wellington, the sculptor, and, yeah. and the, you know, the chalice in Christchurch. And he was at our field camp as well. So the three of them came out for a few days. And it was just marvellous to interact with these people. It's a fantastic programme that Antarctica New Zealand runs. So I think we'll, we'll see all sorts of inspiration in the work of those three uh, as a result of their visit here. And, just to, and sometimes it's, it was interesting for us just to see the environment that we were familiar with through their eyes because they would notice little patterns that perhaps we hadn't picked up on. And uh, it was really delightful. Great people. In all your times that you've been down there, as you said, this is your sixth, have you ever, you know, boomeranged, like you have to go halfway on the plane and then only at that halfway point can you tell whether you're going to be able to land and sometimes you have to go all the way back, hence the expression boomerang? I know, look, I've been so incredibly lucky. You've, been, that's never you know, happened to you, I've ever? I've never been boomeranged. I've been held up in Christchurch several times because of bad weather delaying the flight, yeah. but I've never had to turn around halfway. And now they're flying these C-17 aircraft down. It was the C-141s. So the U.S. Air Force is flying the C-17, which has got a bigger range. And I b believe they can go all the way down and, and turn back if necessary. There's enough fuel on board. But uh, it's a big change. They're quite comfortable, these new aircraft. That's made a big difference to the five-hour journey down there. What do you mean, quite comfortable? Well, they've got proper airline seats, you know. You'll rec recall what it's like being stuffed into a, a star lifter. Yeah. Uh, barely enough leg room, but... Now they're, they're, they're fitted out with regular airline seats. Proper seats? That's you know, wrong. I don't know it's wrong. It's, it shouldn't be done like that. No. It shouldn't be so comfortable, but it's, it's changed things a lot. And certainly it was the most pleasant journey I'd had down. So um, we're very lucky, I must say. We're so lucky in New Zealand uh, being able to latch onto the American program that goes through Christchurch. It makes an enormous difference to us. Yeah, although I suppose it's a fairly symbiotic relationship, isn't it? 
I suppose so. I mean, I, I'm sure it's highly beneficial for the Americans to not only have the Christchurch base, but also to have uh, the New Zealand base nearby. And but of course, they're they're working on a much bigger scale than we are. You know, an order of magnitude larger. And, and their infrastructure is extraordinary down here. The fact that they can land aircraft and that they can bring ships in in the summer really makes it possible for New Zealand to have a base down here. So uh, we are very lucky that way. When I think of the Australians, for example, who don't have the opportunity of getting down to their bases by air, they have to take ships down. I mean, it is possible, literally, for New Zealanders to come down on the ice for a few days because of these flights that take place in the spring. So I think we are very lucky. Is there something that you've done this time that has taken your research further on? I mean, have you? is it only when you get back here that you start analysing things, or do you know things you've found actually there? No, we do analysis on the field, and we've, we've got some curious results in terms of moisture profiling through the ice this year. There's a strange little inflection halfway through the ice sheet, about 700 millimetres down, which is a little odd, which we don't fully understand. It's what do you mean an inflection? Well, it means that normally the, the, the salt content and the water content sort of continuously changes from the top to the bottom of the ice, but, um, which is about two metres thick. But in, this, in the case of this year's this season's measurements, there's a little variation that occurs uh, in halfway down through the ice, which is a little bit inconsistent with previous years. So maybe it's something to do with the way in which the ice grew this year, I'm not sure. But the other thing that's interesting is that we're using nuclear magnetic resonance equipment, which we've built ourselves, and this year we took down a, a new instrument, which we hadn't tried before. Uh, we had great difficulty getting it to work in the cold, but we've learned a lot about how to make it work better next time. So the technology is a real challenge in these conditions. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Everything, everything, isn't it? You have to make things specially, even you know, cameras, everything. Yes, yes, yes. You've got to keep the cameras inside your clothes, close to your body, otherwise the batteries just fail at you. That's right. And, of course, they will fail exactly when the penguin comes past. I've never. You can explain that to me, actually. Why do the batteries in cameras and presumably everything else only last a tiny moment be, and before the cold makes the batteries run out? Well, the cold slows down the motions of the molecules and, of course, the, the, the conduction process that occurs inside a battery is all to do with the mobility of the ions. But it's not like when you get back to warm weather, will those batteries come back to life again? Oh, yes. Oh, will they? they oh, yes. But nothing seems to suffer too much from having been cold. It's just that when it, when it is cold, it, uh, electronics doesn't work so well. So you do have to keep your electronics as warm as possible. That's, that is a problem working in the field. That, that's a challenge. And it's very hard to anticipate those things before you get down there. And, of course, the sea ice itself is salty, so there's a, the damage from uh, salt contamination on uh, you know, electronics and on connectors is always a problem, too. You have to really watch that. Mm. That's all part of the challenges of being here. But then when you go to the hut, you know, Scott's hut and Shackleton's hut, you see how much stuff they brought with them and how they may do with stuff they didn't have. I mean, the inventiveness was extraordinary, wasn't it? Oh, it really was. Uh, they brought a lot of stuff down, it's true. But, I mean, I think the, 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 the expedition that had the, the greatest degree of inventiveness must have been the Ross Sea Party that landed without its full complement of stores because the ship uh, pulled its anchor chain and they were left behind at Scott's Hut and they had to make do with everything they could find there or manufacture out of seals and penguins or whatever in order to lay depots as far as they could to, towards the pole for Shackleton's journey that was supposed to take place, of course, from the other side. Uh, only there was Shackleton's ship being crushed, the endurance being crushed by the ice in the Weddell Sea. So uh, this party uh, had a sort of forlorn task of laying these depots. In fact, Shackleton was never on his way, and they did so with the most extraordinary inventiveness of having, having to use what materials they can find. It's a fantastic story. There you are, Callaghan of the Antarctic, in the footsteps of the heroes of the expeditions. Nice to talk to you, Paul. It's half past eight.
Calf Club Day, the top twins. Well, Gordon McLaughlin has turned his hand to pretty much every kind of uh, journalism, radio, television and print, columns, history, biography, encyclopedias, fiction and polemic. Remember the passionless people. Gordon McLaughlin was editor for four years of the New Zealand Journal of Agriculture, an experience which stood him in good stead, I dare say, for his latest work, which is a history of farming in New Zealand. And he joins me now. Hi, Gordon, how are you? Hello, Kim, how are you? Isn't that a sweet song? Isn't it lovely? Just it would bring a tear to your eye. Yes, it would. It was lovely. Even but this the, time in the morning. Yeah, even this time in the morning. But you see, yeah. I've never been to a calf club day, ah. and yet it still hits me in the heart. Oh, you, which you, seems to indicate to me that there's a strong seam of kind of agricultural rural nostalgia for people who may never even have experienced it. Well, most New Zealanders of my generation, of course, had experienced. I've been to many a calf club function when I was young. Did you have a calf, Gordon? No, I didn't have a calf of my own, but I had friends who had calves. <laughs> had calves, rather. <laughs> calves. You know, all your friends, I've got very influential friends who yeah, had calves. I know someone with a calf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, was that good? No, I mean, that was a very important... Uh, I, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is, is that, or why I've always kept in touch very much with agricultural history, is that you can't really understand the history of New Zealand without understanding the farming history of New Zealand. It's so, been so critical to the, to the country's life for so long. Not so much now, perhaps, but um, until certainly the 80s, um, I think everybody in New Zealand had an understanding of farming. I did. Gardening, all those sorts of things. Mm. I mean, certainly you indicate that had refrigerated shipping, for example, not come along or been invented in 1881, we would have gone down the gurgler. We would have been in desperate trouble because we wouldn't have the population to support a normal economy. It was a very widespread, um, small population, about, what, less, fewer than a million people. And um, So we would have been subsistence. Yeah, yeah. Might Do you think something bad, else would actually. have come along? I mean, the, you, well, there are people who argue that we should never have been encouraged to put all our eggs or all our mutton in the one refrigerated ship, as it were, <clears throat> trying desperately to get back to the original metaphor, because it closed our eyes to a whole lot of other stuff. Well, like what? I, I mean... don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm asking the questions here. <laughs> I mean, in the 1980s, for example, when they decided that um, uh, agriculture was a sunset industry, yeah. the Labour Party did. Who said that? There was a cabinet minister who said that. Yeah, I, mean, it was, I think it was Simon Upton. Uh, um, but, I mean, it was it, not that I blame him for that. It was a generally held mm -hmm. opinion. And I, even at the time, thought maybe they're right. They were talking about um, some of the things they were casting around for were IT works here because it was, uh, nighttime, it was daytime here when it was nighttime in the Northern Hemisphere. And financial transactions, uh, small, accurate, um, small-scale uh, manufacturing, all those things. Mm -hmm. And they have a part. Uh, the only one that's really worked, perhaps, is tourism. But all those other things have a place in New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand economy, but they're never going to uh, matter enough. Or they're not going to matter enough for a long time. For example, you know, you've got a base, econ you've got a base um, a consumer base of four million people. I often hear um, management consultants uh, say, why don't we get more people into exporting? Uh, the trouble with New Zealand is you get a business that develops quite well, and then but they won't take that final leap. Well, it's a huge leap, isn't it? I mm. mean, a guy's got a business. Why does he want need to go to the trouble to go and export to Australia or anywhere else? Mm. So until we get a, a really strong consumer base, I can't see much changing, really. Yeah, although do you get worried about the... I suppose the twin issues of climate change and yep. the attendant issues on that and environmental degradation, which is particularly an issue for the dairy industry. Yes, I do. I think the climate change thing is going to certainly have an impact, but I think it's going to have less, going to have less impact here than it is in other countries, I well, think. Well, I mean, we're already hearing arguments about food miles, you know, and yes. are our kiwi fruit therefore not able to be sustainably devoured in England on account of the fact that they've come from here? Yes, except that they are shipped They're by shipped. Sea. Yeah, That's right. I mean, I think the thing is that that'll settle down. 
Um, and, and, you know, there's going to be a demand for food anyway, the, as the, cheap food as the world gets um, more populous. As far as pollution is concerned, every dairy farmer I spoke to was fully aware of that. I think the issue is who's going to pay for it. There are ways of stopping that. Um, uh, Morgan Williams, I think, the, the environmental commissioner, has written works on that. And, mm. and plenty of scientists will say, look, there are ways of stopping this, polluting lakes and polluting rivers. Uh, well, there are ways of stopping it, but some people want to reduce the amount of dairy farming full stop. I mean, if you look at Canterbury, for example, yeah. people say, look, you're not supposed to be dairy farming here anyway. You need huge amounts of water. We haven't got the water. You're putting too much pressure on the resource. I think that's true. I mean, I, if you look at where dairy farming started and developed in New Zealand, and it started in places with heavy rainfall, Waikato, Muddy Taranaki. Places. Yeah, um, it was never there was never much more than town milk supply in, on the east coast of the South Island for very good reasons. Oh. They don't, they have droughts, and I think um, when I look at some of the sizes of some of the farms down there, I mean some of them have got a thousand cows, two, up to two thousand cows. Uh, you're right. I I can't see how they can sustain that. Mm. Although. It's the money. They're following the money. That's why presumably forests are being chopped down and turned into uh, to dairy farms. Uh, yes, I don't think that's a major problem, though. Forests, the, you know, there's not many forests being cut down and turned into dairy They're farms. They're all few in Canterbury again. I mean, oh, particularly yeah, well, when you're thinking about carbon sinks and the need for more of them. Yes, you're right there. I, I, the whole Canterbury thing is a bit of a worry, I think. It, mm. it's, it's not... If you look at the way when settlers arrived in New Zealand and the, where they lived and what they did, is a pretty good indication of what was sustainable in what areas. You, you look at the way people settle in a city, for example. If you look at where the, the houses were built initially, it's all the areas where people went to which are the most desirable. They weren't stupid. Right. And they weren't stupid about dairy farming. Interestingly enough, you make it clear in your book that conservationists were worried in the 1870s about farming causing the destruction of particularly the North Island forest, lest we think that conservationism is a recent movement. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they were, they were talking about reforestation in the 1890s yeah. and started actually replanting trees in, in, in the 1890s. The erosion was evident early on as well, wasn't it? Yes, they were farming areas in New Zealand that would never be farmed anywhere else in the world. They were farming hills that were too high. They were taking trees off and putting grass on, which mm. couldn't you know, hold on to it. Because they were so hungry for land. Yes, and because, um, yeah, I mean, they had, the more sheep you could put on... Sheep farmers were the problem, really, at that time. Now it's probably dairying that's more of a problem. Mm. Uh, sheep farmers were trying to pack sheep on all over the place because all you had to do was fill them up with grass and shear the wool and you're off. What, you know, in the beginning, not in the beginning, beginning, but, you know, once the settlers arrived and started doing large-scale farming, it was wheat production that was the major thing, wasn't it? Well, it was sheep first. Was it sheep before yeah, wheat? Yeah, it was sheep in the Wairarapa and Canterbury first, but mm. then um, uh, uh, there was what they called the wheat bonanza, I think it was in the 1880s. And I think, that, see, again, before refriger the 1870s, before refrigeration came along, that was a possibility. Australia was doing that. Um, but it was we never had quite the climate. We had huge um, uh, productivity in wheat, actually. We'd get more wheat off an acre than they would anywhere else in the world at one time, except England. But it was never as um, economic here because with wheat you need a large area of flat land. You can go in and just mow and plant, and, you know, we didn't have that kind of land except in Canterbury. Mm. And then the wheat, of course, the, the bottom fell out of wheat prices um, about the time it fell out of wool prices in the 1880s when we had this terrible recession. But the sheep were first, then there was wheat farming, but mixed farming, there was still a lot of sheep. And that's really um, what's changed to me most dramatically is that farmers, being great entrepreneurs, have moved into all sorts of areas like blueberries and other sorts of fruit and vegetables, and they export them. Um, very well. They export them in the northern winter. Would that have ever happened without the hard times of the late 1980s after the government scrapped the subsidies, scrapped the SMPs? Um, probably not. I don't think that... Well, it would have done, but it would have taken long. I don't think it was anything... I, something had to happen in the 1880s. It was just the way it was done. I mean, Australia... Did 1980s? This, uh, yeah, 1980s. That too? Yeah. Um, that had to happen... But um, Australia did the same thing, but they did it much more gradually and much more sensibly. Because we had opinion. too many sheep, essentially, didn't we? Yes, we did, and that was the fault of the government, not the farmers. Mm. Farmers were very nervous about it. They were paying you per sheep. It's an interesting thing, and we had something like 70-odd um, million sheep at that time, 
And the moment they took the subsidy off sheep, there was the, the numbers shrank. You, went, had to, you had to ask yourself if there were certain numbers of sheep on the books that didn't exist. Mm. It's a pity zebras never took off, isn't it? <laughs> Don't look, you think? They look nice. Yeah. <laughs> I think we could have done with a few zebras, although, who knows, they probably would have ended up like the come animal horses. I think so. Yeah. I think so. But, you know, we ended up with rabbits and gorse and possums <clears throat> and deer. Thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. And that was because of the English thing, again, of bringing animals out that they had at home. They mm. would try to turn New Zealand into a little England. One of the things that people don't understand or appreciate is that those people that came out from England, I'm talking about working class people as well. Most of the dairy farms in New Zealand were set up by working class people. They is that why there was a sort of a class, you know, yep. the 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 pastoralists or the sheep farmers would speak somewhat disparagingly about the cow cockies. Yes, that's right. They um, called themselves, um, what do they call themselves, colonists, and they called the working class immigrants. Uh, uh, and, they, and because it, the dairy farmers didn't have the capital to set up, you needed a certain amount of capital to set up a sheep operation. Um, and they, so they just had to chop trees down and they got sometimes 40 acres, which turned out often enough not to be enough. But you have to appreciate at that time, those people came from England and Scotland where the only real status um, symbol in the world was land. And, and people say now they came out here and they raped the land, they didn't care. They cared all right. The, sheep, the original sheep farmers didn't. All they wanted to do was run a whole lot of sheep, shear it, make a lot of money and go home. But the people that came out here to cut the forest down, they were very aware. That was their whole thing, own land. In England, if you own land, you were made. Some of the people that came here had been driven off the land when they fenced the commons and when they, in, in England, in Scotland as well. You're giving me context here for rabbits and gorse and deer. Yes. But I'm not sure what it is yet. Well, these people wanted land. And then when they got enough land, when they got land, what they wanted, they wanted to make it turn into an English farm. Ah. And they did turn into an English farm in lots of cases. And then they started to think, bring in English things. Mm. Uh, I think rabbits were more of an accident than anything else, but um, on a large scale. But they brought in deer to shoot. They brought in all these things that were such a damn nuisance. Nine million rabbit skins exported in yeah. 1882. Yeah, or 18, 1882, yeah. yeah. 17 and a half million in 1894. Yeah. And in the 10 years between 1939 and 1949, 134 million rabbit skins. Yes. So I suppose they had to decommercialise the rabbits, otherwise people would have carried on well, <laughs> happily breeding them. Well, that's right. And, you know, they knew that... Um, Where did all those rabbit skins go, Gordon? Well, presumably to England. To be made into coats and Furs things. and gloves and, yeah, those sorts of things. Good Lord. But it, 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 they damaged the land so much and you couldn't get as much money off them um, as you could get off sheep but mm. some people like um, some people in small lots um, could make a lot in Canterbury could make a lot more money out of uh, rabbits and they could on the and see it was easier too you know it was a lot easier apart from your calf clubs d yes. we, did you have a rural childhood you were um, born in Dunedin yeah yes I was but I my father was a peripatetic journalist and I spent um, years and some years in country towns and then I was well, the last few years of my primary school were spent in Paiatua, in the Wairarapa. But then when I um, left, I became a journalist, I worked in Wellington, I was in the gallery and that. And then I went to Hawke's Bay and I worked on newspapers there. And, but before that, I'd, all, I'd worked in papers in the Wairarapa and Tiaroa, Matter Matter. And then after Hawke's Bay, I joined the Weekly News and the Journal of Agriculture. And for some years, um, I was motoring around New Zealand um, doing stories about rural life. Mm. In those days, with all due respect to agricultural journalists now, agricultural journalists were perhaps held in higher regard or got more front page space? Oh, they were big. I mean, yeah. Peter Freeth on the New Zealand Herald was a commanding figure and was actually offered the editorship at one stage. So they were big. He was very, very well known. He was. They, they were. They were an important part of any newspaper. Those were presumably still the days when the head of Federated Farmers could ring the Prime Minister and <laughs> ask for a meeting. The Prime Minister would say, "When would you like it?" <laughs> yes, I know. Uh -huh. uh, when you say your father was a peripatetic journalist, do you mean in the sense that you are? Um, well, he was much more than I was. When we were kids, he sort of he lived in Eden, and then we went to New Plymouth, and we lived in New Plymouth for, and then we lived in Auckland, and then we lived in Pyatt. And he was working for newspapers. Yeah, he decided uh, he had what I call geographic flight. You know, you <laughs> you think, oh, this is a hell of a place. It's bound to be a better place than this. So he was uh, restless. He was restless. Mm -hmm. He had those Celtic genes that were very restless. And was the family happy to go along with him? 
Um, well, we didn't really have much choice at the time, but... Um, Doesn't it, mean that you were happy, though. No, but I wasn't unhappy. I mean, I was, I, I, I was deeply loved by my parents, um, and that's the thing that matters more than anything else. My sister and I were, were knew that we were really loved by them. They were lovely, warm people. My mother was a bit eccentric, but they were lovely, warm people, so that's the most important thing in the world. How but, eccentric? Oh, pretty, pretty balmy, yeah. In which, <laughs> in which way? <laughs> I had to, had to explain. I, I wrote a memoir and I mentioned a bit about it in there. She's just a very eccentric woman and um, didn't care about people and um, sort of always put a foot in everything and you know said the wrong thing at the wrong time. And um, she was lovely. I mean, I, people used to feel sorry for me. I used to think, half, you know, you don't know. She's wonderful. Did your father think she was eccentric? Well, a few times. You, I mean, when we were being christened and confirmed at the one, at one whack in the Anglican Church, um, the, 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 the parson, the vicar, was very short, and my sister was taller than he was, and I was about the same height. I wasn't very big. And it came to the part where we had to lift the baby up over the font, and my mother started to laugh. And when she started to laugh, she wouldn't actually laugh. I could just feel her shaking, and it got absolutely bizarre. My father walked out. Oh. <laughs> But we thought that was fun, wonderful, you know. I wonder if most people think that their mothers are eccentric in some way. I don't know. I think most people that knew us knew mum was pretty eccentric. Mm. I mean, she's lovably eccentric. That's, yeah. that's the thing. And, and happily eccentric. Yeah. And one of the things it did give me, I spent lots and lots of lonely years as a kid because you'd go to a school and you'd take a long time before you got to know anyone. How many primary schools have you gone to? I went to eight primary schools between the age of nine and... Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, 8 and 12. You see, that I mean, just sounds dreadful. We, yeah. Because I suppose we tend to move around quite a lot now as a, as, a, as a society, we value stability and the whole idea of moving so many schools, it seems dreadful. Well, it either strengthens you or kills you. I yeah. mean, I, my, my mate, Gordon Dryden, had exactly the same experience and uh, his, he moved around all the time. His parents and his mother moved him around. From, and we were talking about it one night and my sister was slightly damaged by it. I mean, not damaged, but I mean, it, it didn't appeal to her as much as it did to me. Mm. But you either fight your way out of it and get quite strong um, mentally or you, you give in. Right. And, and I you think I was lucky. Yeah, I think I was lucky. I had the temperament to do it. But it also made, gave me the chance to read. That's when I, you know, I had nothing else to do half the time when you had to make new friends and couldn't make new friends in a hurry. So that's when I started reading. I mean, you I was, mean you couldn't make new friends in a hurry? Well, it takes or a one little, didn't. It, it, yeah, it takes a little while when you go to a new school. Kids sort of kids are quite cruel in that. They keep you, they sort of keep you at um, arm's length for a while. It takes a little while, mm. especially, especially in small towns. And so I had a lot of time to myself. It didn't worry me too much because I became an avid reader when I was, um, you know, I was reading Dickens when I was 10 and 11. Was that unusual? Uh, no, because the, contrary to what people think, there were almost no children's books then. Yeah, but well, that's right. So, yeah, that's right. So adult books, the were children's books and vice versa. Yeah. That's right. I mean, that's why people were reading those sorts of books then mm. that they don't, they're not, they don't now read until they're in their late teens or... 20s. Do you think that children's books may be not such a good thing? Well, I think, um, I don't know. I think some in some cases it's hard to match a kid. I've got a, a grandson who's got a, he's 10 or 11, he's got a reading age of 15. And I, it's fine, it's difficult to find books from. I mean, he doesn't feel, well, they don't think it's a good idea to give him grown-up books. But there's not really kids' books that seem... I mean, I'm sure there are, but we don't seem to be able to find the ones to match it. So he doesn't read as much as I would like him to. I don't suppose he's inclined towards Dickens these days, is he? No, probably not. Mm. Um, I've had a sort of talk with him about it, but he's, uh, he's much more interested in playing football, which is... <laughs> What have you kept in its place? Which is perfectly fine. <laughs> what part of this book interested you the most in researching it? I think the, the attitude, I think this kind of political angles of farmers in, uh, in relation to Britain, the, the relationship between New Zealand and Britain that existed for so long, and the strains. For example, the situation that developed in the 1970s with, in 60s and 70s with um, Britain joining the EEC had happened in the 1930s during, it got very close to that in the 1930s where Britain were going to put us on, on quotas. I do a chapter on that and it's, 
and it's really interesting that um, we were seriously let down by Britain, or threatened to be seriously let, let down by Britain during the um, the uh, depression. So we should have known, really, that mm. countries always serve their own best interests, um, and they don't ever serve anyone else's best interests. So, so that kind of cultural cringe underwritten by dependency and resentment of dependency, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm talking to Valerie Monk later on, who's written the biography, I suppose, of Crown Lynn. And she, um, it, much the same thing, you know, it hit its straps in 1960s and 70s. And the proprietor, Tom Clark, would, he went through a stage of saying made in Britain on the bottom of it so that people would buy it. Yes, that's right. I mean, New Zealand had that problem in the early days of dairying. I mean, people in England used to take the label off because Danish butter was, was actually better anyway. And um, Europe, other European Dutch butter was was nicer than New Zealand butter. There was a lot of trouble getting consistency of product here. Mm. But you know, the good thing about it is that the the future looks so good. I think for New Zealand, if it's handled right, um, I spent the last six weeks in Australia, and what intrigued me is that Australia's prob- having the same kind of problems with uh, we're having multiplied by a hundred. Um, half the farms on Australia at the, in Australia at the moment are on drought relief. Half of them? Half of them. Not all, not all massive amounts, but they've got some form of drought relief. Mm. Some of them are, are, are um, uh, crops have failed all over New South Wales and uh, parts of Victoria. And, um, and people are presumably saying, look, is this, is this going to be permanent? And do, are we in the wrong place? Should we walk off the land? Well, Howard has finally come around to thinking that maybe climate change has got something to do with this. And he's giving billions of, pe- of dollars to people to stay on the land. And a lot of scientists and agriculture are saying, look, this is crazy. Mm. This land ought to be left. It, it's no longer an economic proposition. And Howard, being a politician, has said things like, you know, our great rural tradition, our culture is based on this. We can't allow this. I'm not going to... No farmer's going to walk off the land when, mm. I, you know, all this sort of... Nonsense. But that's always been the difference, hasn't it? That a factory that was losing that amount of money needed propped up. People say, right, factory's going to go. But a farm is a business and more. It's a lifestyle. Yes, it is. So there is sentiment I think in, I think in New Zealand, the one, wonderful thing about the dairy industry, although it's sad in a way, the wonderful thing about the dairy industry is these guys, are, the, the modern dairy farmer, is a, a very ruthless economic manager. Um, they do very well. When I was a, a kid working on dairy farms, you, you, a, a, a herd of 50 would get you by, a herd mm. of 40 you could earn a living out mm. of. Um, and so they all had names and they were all personalities or cow, al- cow analogies or whatever you like to call them. But now they all have numbers, and they are they're in a herd book, and they are, you know they their performance is measured, and nothing. And there's a kind of impersonality about it now that is makes it more of a business, and it's less of a sentimental lifestyle. That's right. Although I'm not sure I want to eat something that had a name. Um, well, I don't know because they only milk them in mean, dairy farms. Uh, but I mean, every farmer has. In a, the end. Yeah. Well, you, you don't eat too many dairy cows, really. They, by the time they've had a good um, dairying life, they're not into much. They're into oh, manufacturing beef. That's really. why you're editor for four years of the New Zealand Journal of Agriculture. <laughs> Are you a frustrated farmer? I was. I was. I, you see, I, I had, it was a garden of... Uh, I always wanted to be a um, horticulturist, and, mm. but I never... At the time when I was young, I wanted to be a journalist. As all members of my family had been journalists. My father and his two brothers were journalists. Um, but as I got older and older, until I, when I got into my late 30s and that, I really would have liked to have um, done it. But it was too late, you know. Why? Well, I was doing pretty well at journalism and I was having a good life and I was travelling around the world and it just seemed to be maybe... Uh, but at one stage I bought a half an acre down on the Coromandel. I used to, far, used to you know, grow enough vegetables, everybody within stone's throw of our place. Uh, and I loved that very much. Um, but... It was too hard by then. Yeah? Yeah. And it's also very scientific now. I mean, you have to really know what you're doing. Yeah. You could have a nice little lifestyle block with chickens and things now. <laughs> well, Wouldn't I... Wouldn't you like that? Uh, well, no, not really. That's... I tell you what, in the text of your book, you've got shades of passionless people, I reckon. In the introduction, you say, I feel a great unease now as some of the finest grassland in the world yields to urban subdivisions and their barren monotonous houses that will one day spawn barren, monotonous children. 
Have you been to Auckland lately? That's a bit harsh, Gordon. Have you you been to Auckland lately? Yeah, well, you know, barren, monotonous children. Probably. Well, probably. It's a terrible way to bring kids up. It's like bringing up battery hens. They bring them up in apartments and, you know, uh, closed-in areas. I know. Maybe they have secret lives of interest and rich tapestry. I mean, it's hard well, to look at the outside. You look from the outside, you think, I wouldn't like to live like that. But Well, I'm, I'm conditioned by, to some degree by my father, which was a very New Zealand attitude at the time. He had tri- when there was w- virtually no um, child crime in New Zealand, he used to say the reason they have tr- child crime in New York is they live in tenements. You can't get the kids and kick them outside. Mm. Um, they had this very serious theory for a long time. Yeah. Uh, it's not true, but I think there's some truth in it. Yes. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Gordon McLaughlin, whose book, The Farming of New Zealand, The People and the Land, is published by Penguin Viking. It's coming up to nine o'clock.